Officially, Sheikh Fahim Qasmi, welcome to podcast. Thanks so much. Can we cheers? Thanks for the tea. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, are you going by Sheikh Fahim now or Turtle Sheikh? Uh, um, I've always been Fahim. To the people that are friends and we are friends, I've always been Fahim. And, and that's what it'll always be. Um, you know, Turtle Sheikh is something that for me I only uh, allowed to be you know, as, as promoted as it was because it brought attention to an issue that mattered most to me. And if that took one time me getting a title like that, um, I'd prefer Turtle Sheikh over anything else. But that's true. Uh, ever since I met you, by the way, just a little bit of context for anybody that's uh, listening and watching. We met about 11 years ago in management consulting, and I would have never figured that you are part of the royal family, that you are a sheikh. You know, you were one of those cool dudes at the office, humble, down to earth, funny, and like just running around, you know, being like, being just another colleague at work. Um, and the whole Turtle Sheikh is actually <laughs> one of the most exciting. T- you have, a very, I was telling you earlier, you have one of the r- most diverse, eclectic biographies for anybody, never mind somebody who is uh, part of the royal family and also has one foot in the government and the other in the private sector. So, um, you know, management consulting, startups, venture capital. Um, but I definitely want to start with the Turtle Sheikh because that's the most recent and most like fascinating thing that I think you've, you're doing. Um, The National, uh, basically, uh, there was a news coverage of you six months ago. If I'm not mistaken, you've rescued 2,000 turtles that were endangered or... Yeah, so let let me give you the full story so we we don't get mixed up. Um, I I live in the ocean. I I grew up in the ocean. I I grew up living by the sea. And um, it was my co-founder's birthday. And there was this beautiful opportunity to take a boat out to an island called Sir Buneir, which is part of Sharjah. Um, and we were free diving, uh, which we love doing. You know, it's it's the most free you can be underwater. Uh, and personally, for some people that that, that don't know, uh, as free divers, turtles are the best free divers in the world, right? They can hold their breath for hours. So we were free diving, um, and I've always loved turtles. It's always been a joke that you know I wish I was a turtle. And Subhanallah, like at that moment, um, I was swimming and I saw this turtle that was struggling. I was like, this turtle's not doing so well. But if you know anything about nature, you leave nature alone unless they're in distress. So I left it alone and I kept swimming with my, with my buddies. And then an hour later, and it was like 10th body, you know, I was like, oh, I need to go back and check on it. And I came back and if the turtle was in the same place, it was in trouble. Turtles move around, you know. And it was in the same place. So I did what I didn't think I was going to do. Uh, it was about six, seven meters underwater. So I held my breath. So I'm down picked up the turtle, started swimming. She was about 25 kilos. And uh, I started swimming to the surface. And a meter before I got to the top of the surface, uh, I felt the tug of a rope and I was stuck. And I looked and only then could I see the fishing line that was caught around the turtle's flipper in its head. So luckily we free dive with with diving knives. So I pulled out the knife, still holding my breath. This turtle still holding its breath. I didn't know how long it was down there for. It was drowning technically. Yeah and cut away the rope and I brought her to the surface so her and I could have a breath of air. Oh my God. Called over a boat, um, the, the dinghy from the sailing yacht we were on and we put the, the turtle on the, on the dinghy and I called Charger's environmental agency, sent a boat straight away, took care of the turtle. I spent about 25 minutes cutting away fishing line. Wow. Um, you'll see from pictures if you show that, I, I try not to show these pictures and we'll talk about that later. Um, the fishing line had cut the flipper off. Was it the graphic vi- visual? To straight to the bone. Oh uh, my god! I was cutting string off bone. Um, I then uh, was told by Sharjah that they didn't have the facilities to re- rehabilitate this turtle, and they had sent it to Burj Al Arab. So a lot of people don't know that inside Burj Al Arab is the turtle hospital. Um, the Dubai Turtle Rehabilitation Project has saved two thousand turtles since two thousand four. Um, I joined the project last year. Uh, when they asked me after this story had come out uh, to be the ambassador. And Farah, as I named the turtle, um, recovered well. She still has only one flipper. Um, so you named the turtle Farah? Uh, it, like it was... Turtles, like your little pet? Turtles bring me joy. Um, and I always said if I had a daughter, um, we would name her Farah. I never had a daughter. I have two sons. God bless them. But uh, my wife and I decided we'd call this turtle Farah because she was a female. 
um, and we released her months later. And I still track her movement till today. Dude, I'm getting goosebumps hearing the story, but not all heroes wear capes. Well, I guess some of them wear swimsuits and go <laughs> diving after <laughs> turtles. Um, I, you know, it's been 11 years since you and I caught up, and um, this is only like one of the fascinating things about like what you've been up to. Um, but the fact that there is even a Dubai turtle rehabilitation project, like how bad is this turtle problem in the UAE? I mean, huh? the turtle problem is global. Right. Okay. The turtle problem is not a, a, a Dubai only issue or a United Arab Emirates issue. They are global citizens. The second longest turtle ever tracked left the UAE and swam 8,600 kilometers to Thailand. Mm -hmm. So we are saving turtles that may have come from Asia, from the Indian Ocean. A lot come from Oman. Um, and when they get sick, they can get sick on anybody's coastline. Um, right. We just happen to have the facilities to be able to spot and save them. So is it disease or is it the pollution that they get tangled so up So there, there, there are four main causes, I would say, for turtles getting injured. Uh, the first and most common one is not human-related. Mm -hmm. Something called cold stunning. So turtles are cold-blooded animals, which means when it gets really cold in the winter, the water temperatures drop, they don't swim as fast. But we have in these waters very, uh, very, very active marine biodiversity. And barnacles grow on them. And when the barnacles grow on baby turtles they get weighed down. And when they get weighed down, they can't swim, and then they wash up on beaches. So the first thing we actually did when I joined the project, and maybe this will come out, I hope, in, in, in the discussions, is I'm a doer, right? So when, when Jumeirah Group asked me, they said, you know, would you, would you have this title? And I said, look, I'd be honored to be the ambassador on one condition. And they said, what's the condition? I said, well, I want to change stuff. Yeah. I'm not here to sit back and get a title and show up at events and shake hands. Right. So they said, okay, well, you know, what do you want to do? I said, well, all these turtles are washing up on beaches. Right. What do you do when you find a turtle? Yeah. And they said, well, you call the Dubai Turtle Rehabilitation Project. And I said, well, what's the number? And they were like, well, it's on our website and the Facebook group. It's zero four three whatever, whatever the number is. Yeah. I was like, well, nobody's going to remember that. Can I do something? And they're like, whatever you want. You're the project ambassador. So I called up at Salat and I was like, can I have 800 turtles? Oh, God, I was going to ask you. <laughs> They said, what? And I said, yeah, I want 800 turtle as a number. That's brilliant. And they were like, do you have a company? I said, yeah, registered on one of the companies I'd started. So I was like, okay, registered on that. And they said, where do you want to direct it to? I said, whatever this number is, 043, whatever. And we launched the campaign, if you find a turtle, call 800 turtle. And that's, um, that's across the country now. What a cool hack. Um, simple hack. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people are like, you know, fine, you know, spend all your money on saving turtles. This cost me 100 dirhams a month. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you now, we've saved 56 turtles. All but four have come through that number this year. All but four have come through this number. So the people are calling in. 52 turtles have been saved using that number today. That's amazing, man. And that's oh my since gosh. January. And now this is, this is sort of my message in, in life is that you know, a lot of people call me up and they say, you know, we want to give money to the project. Yeah. I'm like, we don't need money. Yeah. I need new ideas. But to what, it, I mean, first of all, again, goosebumps because say, I mean, as a dog owner, I just love animals and you don't have to be a dog owner to love animals. And so when you watch these National Geographic videos or Facebook, Insta like I guess turtles, I've seen turtles tangled up with straws in their noses or nets. That was the famous one, yeah. Yeah, and it was very visual. And then so uh, to actually meet somebody who is hands-on dealing with this kind of problem is, um, you know, it's, it's inspiring on the one hand, but also, uh, yeah, I, I'm still getting goosebumps talking about it. This is amazing. Um, and I wonder to what extent this is a coincidence because you're also... See, I was saying earlier, you have this rich biography. Um, and let me kind of just go over it quickly. And I want to ask you about Seafood Souk, which you are currently the co-founder of, right? Um, so real quick, you started off in management consulting, went to Mubadala, um, worked with a media, Taqarrabu, uh, hybrid communications. At one point, I think you had a VC firm. You were investing in companies uh, as well? No, I'm an angel investor. Angel investor, right, yeah. Um, and the mo well, very, one of the most interesting things, things about you is you are part of the royal family. So the ruler of Sharjah is your uncle. Um, and, and, and so it just blows my mind how you have all these different hats that I can imagine you must be wearing and archetypes that you need to become when you're a government official, when you are part of the royal family, when you're in the private sector, or when you're in the sea saving turtles. Um, but the fact that we're talking about turtles and the sea and marine life, seafood souk, um, I have an idea about it, but I'll let you speak in your words. What is it, and and you know, to what extent it had? Is it just a coincidence that turtles and seafood souk happen to be happening at the same time? Like, is it like I said, I grew up in the I grew up in the ocean. Um, the first angel investment I ever made was uh, one of my best friends and I 
uh, started something called uh, Surf House Dubai. Yeah. We co own Dubai's only surf shop and, and surf school. Yeah. And Dan, Scott, and I founded, they founded it first. I joined a bit later. Um, and we grew up surfing. I grew up surfing here in, in the water. I grew up fishing in the water. I grew up sailing. Yeah. I grew up diving. And so I live in the ocean. And I think what I've learned in life more than anything is that, you know, you know people always say, you know, follow your passions. <sighs> Very difficult to do if you don't know what your passion is. But I was fortunate enough to know that anything that is associated with the ocean means that I speak, frankly, and, you know, from the heart. I know that sounds pretty cheesy, but it is actually true. I actually care. And when I care, it becomes effortless. It's effortless for me to take my time out of the day and speak to the press and speak to the media about these issues because... I actually do care about them. And they always say, you know, people call me up and they go, your content on Instagram is amazing. I'm like, it's not content, it's my life. You is know? it because you happen to be living in a country that is by the ocean? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I grew up by the beach. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't know this. I actually grew up in Dubai. I didn't grow up in Sharjah. And, and I grew up around the corner from the sailing club where I currently sit on the board. And I grew up every morning, sometimes before school, skipping school, to go surf and to go and sail on the beach and to go dive with, with, with marine life. And fast forward you know, for 25 years of being at the sailing club, I was sitting there having dinner with a friend of mine who has an oyster farm here called Dibba Bay Oysters. Great oysters. Yeah. And he had introduced me to a guy called Sean Dennis that was entrepreneur in residence at Dubai Future Foundation, was in town kind of working out what he wanted to do next. And Remy was talking about the challenges that he had with getting his oysters to the end to the business buyer without going through distributors. Right. And we said, you know, that's super interesting, fant fascinating challenge. And Sean, coming from the tech world, said, yeah, B2B marketplace for fish. Yeah. So I sort of looked at Sean and I said, tell me more. Yeah. He ran me through what he thought could be a business model that would work. Yeah. We then spent the next three months in my, my home office at home putting post-it notes on the wall came up with a business model. But the real fascinating thing that we found out was that when you create a business model that tracks the supply chain or simplifies the supply chain, you can track it. Mm. And we realized not only could we create a B2B marketplace to trade fish, but we could create the first traceability solution for the supply chain of global seafood trade called SFS Trace. Traceability to, uh, for what, to what end? Let <coughs> me put it this way. There are four large hotel groups. Mm -hmm and one very large retailer in Dubai that are already rolling this out. Um, but we have large distributors and products in Europe already using our trace technology. Mm -hmm. One in five pieces of seafood that you eat are mislabeled. Okay. And the problem is that seafood supply chains are so opaque. There's multiple issues that we're talking about. Go to a restaurant, order a steak, the waiter will tell you which farm it came from. When it comes to seafood, they maybe give you the country. Mm. I need to break down seafood. This will be a bit boring now, but no, I, need no, to break, I, need to, I need to break down the seafood industry. The seafood industry is a $200 billion industry. Half of it today is farmed. Fish farming. Yeah. Salmon, sea bass, you name it. Yeah. For us, that's the super easy part to solve. Mm. Today, if you order a piece of salmon at a company that buys fish on our platform or uses our traceability technology, you scan the QR code, it will tell you, yes, and this is from... Scotland, it's from this farm, it was on EK156 that left, you know, this, you know, city and arrived in Dubai on this date and was processed on this date. Like okay. all of that, right? all of that information is readily available to the end consumer if you need okay. it. Okay, okay. For distributors or for business buyers, they use it as supply chain sort of visibility. So, they know, where, so they know where their orders are because right. sometimes, you know, when you're shipping by sea, you want to know where the ship is and all the rest of it. That's fascinating work for us, and we love it. The other half, the $100 billion that's left, is something that's called capture fisheries or wild-caught fish. Yeah. Fishing is more like mining than farming. It's the only food source that we extract from the earth, hoping that there is more there to extract at a later date. Think about that for a second. Because you don't really know how, how much of it can repopulate or... My, fish are migratory. Uh, you hope that governments have data on fish stocks. Really hard to manage, really hard to monitor. There isn't data to really tell you how much fish is left in the ocean, but you ask fishermen and they will always tell you the same thing. Assumption-based. Uh, there's less fish this year than last year. Oh, yeah, not even. <laughs> right? So when Sean and I looked at the business model and we said, if we can build traceability 
Sean says this best, it would be the precursor to sustainability. Wow. And that's where we realize one of the biggest issues in fishing today is what they call IUU, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. Okay. If I trace to the boats, I can cut out IUU fishing and prove every bit of fish and where it came from. Nice. It wow. goes one step further. I'll give you this case study. We were in Oman. Oman catches the most beautiful yellowfin tuna. The problem is the way they were catching it, they were catching it in nets. And by the time they pulled it out of the nets a day later, two days later, the fish had suffocated. They put it on a boat, no ice. They took it to the coast, put it on the back of a pickup truck. By the time it gets to the buyer, it's so degraded that it's only good for dog food or canning, maybe. So they were selling it for 75 cents a kilo. Yeah. To the Omani fishermen, to make money, they needed to catch a lot of fish. Those nets also catch bycatch, fish that they discard, and turtles that die. This is where the link comes in. Right. We worked with an organization called IPNLF, the International Pole and Line Fishing Organization. They're an NGO. They teach Omani fishermen now to catch fish one by one, masinar, with a fishing rod. Yeah. And they pull the fish out, and they slaughter it properly, a technique called ikejime from Japan. They bleed the fish so the quality remains. They ice it, and they bring back that fish. I told you before it was 75 cents a kilo. Now it's like $12 a kilo. Wow, and it's human-grade fish. <laughs> this goes into sushi now in Europe and the U.S. Oh, wow. But the fishermen are being paid more, and they're catching less because they didn't need to catch as much to make a living. Fascinating. So so your mandate as Seafood Souk is, is, on the one hand, optimizing supply chain and making sure like consumers and businesses know what they're getting, but you're also getting involved on the beginning of the value chain. Yeah, what we realized, and look, I'd like to say we thought about this when we started the business. The business is nearly four years old, and you're in entrepreneurship, you know entrepreneurship is about picking a challenge and doing whatever it takes to work out how to solve it. Yeah. As we built the company, we then realized straight away that this could be solved. And for us, it was more them telling us that we were a solution. Yeah. Because what they had was, look, we're investing so much into changing the way we fish, but I can't prove to the end consumer traceability through the supply chain. Yeah. Because when my fish ends up in the opaque supply chain, it's treated like any other fish in the supply chain. Right. So for us, what we realized was lifting the lid on the problems actually helped lift the lid on, these are the guys that are doing oh it right, God. are you willing to do that? And I can tell you the same with Mahi Mahi from Oman into the US. I can talk about prawns coming from Bangladesh into Europe. Uh, we operate in the US, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. That's amazing. But your customers, your end customers are the consumers in the UE? No, our end customers are business buyers globally. In oh, okay. Countries. So your suppliers are global, your buyers are global. Correct. Fascinating. By the way, on that note, real quick, do you know who Right Farm is? No, I haven't heard of them. So uh, coincidentally, it happens to be the, the ep just last episode. So you're, this is episode 27. Episode 26, I had a guy called Elise Kaf on. A uh, Lebanese guy, lovely guy, ex-AUB, just like yourself, ex-consultant. And they're doing supply chain optimization for food, for agriculture, though. So not seafood. Um, and there will be a whole episode, so we can, you can watch it, and I guess others can watch it. But they're trying to solve one thing is uh, the consistency of the mangoes, the avocados, whatever it is that you're going to be getting as a restaurant, as a hotel, um, always on time, always in quality. But then they found themselves also uh, dealing with a problem that they didn't think they were going to be dealing with. And, I, and that was like uh, focusing on improving the local produce that is in the UAE, because the UAE seems to have a sustainability problem, right? Like like the climate was obviously challenging. Um, but there is a lot to do on like nutrition, sustainability, whether it's seafood, whether it's agriculture in their case. Mm -hmm. So, but it's interesting to see how like those who are venturing into, like in your case with seafood, you, you start to focus on one problem and you realize like, if, you got, if I'm gonna solve the problem holistically, I'm gonna have to like, uh, you know, basically deal with every component of it. And, and I guess on the one hand, that's a good business opportunity, but the impact also gets greater exponentially. Yeah, I think for us, you know, being a marketplace and, and for us noticing that the majority of challenges that can be solved were in the supply chain, we became a supply chain play. Um, I don't think I would ever invest in new productions of fish and how it's done. Mm. Uh, I don't think we'll ever own a fleet of ships. Um, but I do think we need to create a fair and transparent marketplace where people know what they're buying. Yeah. I think the challenge we face in the food world in general is there are people that are consistently looking at creating new ways of, of, of making food. Mm -hmm. um, I put my opinion on the table very openly. I don't think that's the world's problem. Yeah. With all due respect, I don't think lab-grown meat is going to be how we solve this. Yeah. 
it's very expensive and your labs are not going to be growing feeding um, people in, in, in markets that still rely on seafood. So one third of the world still needs seafood to eat or to make a living. Yeah. Right. Lab grown prawns. Great concept. By all means, let's push the envelope. But I don't think that is going to stop uh, a young person in Vietnam going out and fishing. Mm. A young person um, in Djibouti or in, Se- yeah, in, in, in Senegal or, in, um, you know, we're working in, in Zanzibar, stopping going out there and fishing because yeah. that's their living. That's their livelihood. And sometimes they're eating some of that fish as well. That's right, right? yeah. So for us, we took a very, very stern approach on the problem with food security today and, and the political challenge that happened with food these days is not the availability of food, but more the price of food. Mm. And the price of food, you know, people did not riot in North Africa over the lack of bread. It was the price of bread going up. It was the input factors of wheat into their production that went up. And price fixing maybe by the government? Not stuff? necessarily. I think yeah. there's, the, there's the availability of food at a price. You know, I can, I can farm you the best salmon in the world. Yeah. It'll probably cost you 3x what the Norwegians can do it for. Sure. Yes, it's in our borders if supply chains get disrupted, but it still is the most expensive salmon in the world. Yeah. So for me, the question... And, 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 and like I say, this is in no way disrespect to other people that are, that are trying and, and new business models. It's just, I think, if you're an entrepreneur, you're in the business of really trying to solve a problem. Sure. And for me, my life's mission is to save our oceans. And there is a hypothesis that saving our oceans means growing fish in labs. But when I look at the issue at a macro level, I'm more empowered to try to help that fisherman in Vietnam, that fisherman in Zanzibar, that fisherman in Mauritius, Oman, business buyers in the US, Europe, make better decisions in the existing supply chain. To save the ocean and also to maintain themselves a, 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 like a good livelihood that would be a decent livelihood for them to maintain a ethical sourcing of these um, animals. Indeed, I think you know if we were to actually distribute, and fish is a unique one. So seafood, yes, I love the oceans. Mm. I will, you know, my life's mission post seafood soup you know, long may it continue, but my, my life's mission is to save the world's oceans. Wow. I was thinking, like, again, this is this came up actually with, uh, I can't remember which picture, I think it was two episodes ago with uh, um, Zina Ajlouni. At which point does a person, as an entrepreneur, prioritize impact over the commercial opportunity? Because every oppor- every entrepreneurial opportunity um, has in it like, well, yeah, we could make some money doing this company. Uh, and then part of it is also I- impact driven, like we could solve this problem or I'd like to solve this problem. But I think entrepreneurs all fall on the spectrum. Some are more incentivized with how big that company can be and valuation and money. Others are like fixated on, and that's very admirable, on the problem first and foremost, and the money will come. In your case, it sounds like, and also I know you, um, you're very gen- true to the problem um, I'm sure that it's not at the expense of also like, you know, wearing a commercial hat on. But what would you say, you know, you know, how, how do you go through these, um, in what order, or how, how were you able to get to a point where the impact matters to you much more than the commercial opportunity, that first and foremost, your mission is to solve, uh, you know, the problem that you're talking about, which is to save the oceans? If you were to ask me if I'm an idealist or a realist, I'm very much a realist. Um, you know, Sean, my co-founder, he had a wonderful opportunity at the Charge Entrepreneurship Festival to have a fireside chat um, with the director and, and, and the creator of Seaspiracy. Yeah. Right? Massive risk as a startup in the seafood industry to go up against, um, you know, uh, this gentleman in a conversation. But I think there was a practical approach to it. You know, for me, as a realist, and I sit more on the realist than the idealist side, I think, can we solve all the problems? No. Are there, and maybe we learned this in consulting, is there an existing supply chain? Are there existing business models that are that efficient that you can fundamentally change? No. What can we do to solve a very unique point of impact? So for me, my unique point of impact is one, transparency in the supply chain, particularly. So one in five pieces of seafood are mislabeled you're eating fish that should not be fished and they're selling it to you as something else. The other one is IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And I think for me, I am very careful to, I I think the more laser focused you are on the problem you're solving, 
And, and that's what Sifu Tzuk does. Saving the ocean is my personal mission. How I do it in Sifu Tzuk with, with, with Sean is we know we can clean up the, 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 the trade of seafood globally. Yeah, and build a company while we're at it. Yeah, we can build a company while we're at it. I think it, it is commercially viable. I don't think you win unless you're commercially viable. I don't think yeah. people adopt it unless you're commercially viable. But the one thought that I want to leave you with is, you know, people, I never use this term because I, I don't believe in it. When people say you're disrupting. Yeah. Right. Disruption is a great term because it sounds like you're fundamentally changing the way things are done. We are trying to change the way in which people buy and sell fish and how it's traced in the supply chain. That's the most basic version of what we're sure. doing, right? People always talk, you know, we're doing this because we're going to disrupt this. We're going to do this because we're going to disrupt this. And disruption was created by one industry that was hyper-disrupted. So I created, like, created, I use the term hyper-disruption. Hyper-disruption is what kicked off our last tech boom. Hyper-disruption is when your means of production, transmission, and consumption change. That happened to one industry in the last 10 years. The internet. It was media. Oh, media, right, yeah. The way we produce content, media content, the way we transmit it, and the way we consume it has all moved yeah. to your mobile phone. I guess proliferated by the internet and technology, yeah, fair enough. But media at the, at the core, you're right. And media companies have changed globally. Yes. They have been hyper-disrupted. Now, I challenge you to take any other industry and look at the way we produce, the way we transmit, and the way we consume, and how much they've actually changed. A lot of people are solving for one of those. Yeah, you know, they're a still lot very of, rudimentary. A lot of people think that you know, they're disrupting the, the food space by creating cloud kitchens and, and these, these aggregators that are doing it. They're only changing the way in which we are actually consuming. <coughs> the way we produce food, still pretty much the same. Yeah. It's McDonald's 2.0. That's right. The way we're actually moving food around, it's still delivery bikes. It's just, just faster. It's, just, it's faster because you're actually outsourcing it to somebody yeah. like a Kerim or a Talabat or whatever. Yeah. You know, but you're actually just not owning the bikes. You and I remember the days where you'd call, you know, a fast food joint and direct them to your house by telling them right, then left, then right. <laughs> Next to the supermarket. <laughs> left after right, after left, after this, stop when you see, you know, after when, the mosque. When you find that supermarket, you keep going straight. Yeah, and right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so you know, I'm, I'm trying to be realistic in the sense that, you know, when I, because I started off my life as an investor, yeah. I was actually the founding investor of Seafood Too before I joined as a co-founder, was first and foremost to be very clear on what you're actually trying to change. I'm not here to try to create a platform that's going to change the way people eat fish, the people trade fish, and the way that people produce fish. Yeah. All I'm trying to do is to say the one problem we've learned is B2B in that supply chain yeah. is where with technology we can solve the most amount of problems. Let's stay laser focused on that. Yeah, and I think something, so, so just to also kind of tell you where I'm coming at this from, there is this, uh, uh, the, 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 the Silicon Valley environment, which started in Silicon Valley, and then it, it made its way to all different parts of the world, including here in the, in the region. Um, and valuations, like extremely inflated valuations for startups, became a reason for entrepreneurs to start a company First and foremost, because of the valuation that they think they're going to get and how much they can sell it for. And then almost secondary to that is what are we trying to f solve? Because that would be a good you know, thing to include in our pitch deck that we're trying to solve that problem. But the problem is less important than how big this company can be. And so it always felt to me like entrepreneurs always have those two you know, objectives in mind. How much money are we going to make by valuation, by raising, by exiting? And the problem we're going to solve, but like... It, uh, as I talk to many, many more entrepreneurs, some seem to be more true to the problem and others, you know, you can tell valuation and, and, and the flipping of the company and the raise, the valuation they're going to get is more important. And the reason I say this is because I know that a few years ago, you got into a bit of a debate with Fadi Randur. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, 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 I, the famous Fadi debate. Yeah. yeah, and I chimed in on it. I remember on LinkedIn, I actually pulled up that post uh, before you came like uh, yesterday. And I remember that there was something called the P word, so the profit was basically, I think, if I'm not mistaken, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, Fadi being Fadi, you know, a venture capitalist, um, basically, uh, you know, he's shilling startups, valuations, growth, VC mentality. And I think if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, you were arguing more about, you know, you got to be a business that is legitimately making money, making cash, making profits. It's not about hype and growth and valuation because that's not sustainable. And I think that seems to fall more within what they call the zebra startups. Zebra startups, if, if you've heard the term, is basically um, companies that are making money and also for an impact. So it's, it's not so much about just a company for the sake of making growth. And so how much of that do you still think about? So uh, let, we have to go back to that. And Fadi and I are friends, right? So yeah. I, I don't, no disrespect. I was trying to be facetious. I, f I find 
to get a share of voice these days, you need to be very outspoken. And for me, I thought, hey, what can I argue on? Uh, you know, and I have a particular viewpoint on this issue, so let me make it a big issue. Sure, yeah. Rather than zebras, the term we use is camels. We need more camels, not unicorns. Um, and Google the article. It's fascinating. It'll give you an insight in how I think about it. I much prefer pointing somebody that has written something far better than I could ever write. Right. Um, and, and going back to the Silicon Valley model, I think the valley of death works in two, with three key enabling factors in the U.S. Number one, they were driven by media that was hyper-disrupted. Mm. They could go through the valley of death because at scale, when you become a Facebook, a Google, you are not valued the same way any other media company is valued, nor any other startup. Right. And breaking into that new market of hyper-disrupted media was extremely profitable. Number two, you have a huge venture capital industry with deep pockets post a, a very difficult recession when you and I started working together sure. right around then for them to go off and, and, and win. Right. So access capital was huge. The last one is you have a huge market that is homogeneous. And I challenge a lot of big names that talk about how big the Middle Eastern market is. The Middle Eastern market is big, but it's not as homogeneous as the US. Selling in Egypt, selling in Tunis, selling in Beirut is not the same as selling in the UAE, nor Saudi, nor Pakistan, nor, you know. Yeah. So I'm a bit cautious of the whole Localization has complexity. It, it does have complexity, and, and I don't think the, the, the market is definitely there, but you need to have a much more sophisticated, maybe a B2B product, rather than a B2C product if you're going to try to win that way. Having said that, there are people that have broken that. Kerim was extremely successful, and what Modusser and, and Magnus built, super impressed with. So... That's the U.S. model. Yeah. When we started, I was challenging, even my, my co-founder, Sean, and I still argue about this, because you and I started working in a recession, or I started just before it, Carney, you joined. Yeah. I remember what it was like in a recession. Yeah. And therefore, I always said, what if you can't fundraise in perpetuity? Because fundraising is not a product of how well you are. It's how well you are compared to your peers in trying to access capital and the availability of that capital at that time. And the macro cycle that you're in. Of course. And we were all raising, you know, post 2014. This was like the good days. days. The good days, right? Yeah. So I always had this question of like, well, worst case scenario, if we had to switch off the funding tabs, how would we make a profit? Yeah. Because if you have profit, this is my other viewpoint, is if you have, if you have a route to profitability, or you have profitability, you have access to other forms of capital. Sure. Venture capital is not the only form of capital you can access. Yeah. At Sifutsu, at the moment, we're looking at different forms of debt. Yeah. We're looking at different, because we, we, we make money. We actually... There's an actual cash profit. <laughs> there is a, we've been gross profit, profit positive since day one. Yeah. Right? It, it's, for us, we knew that we didn't have to take very expensive venture capital to be able to grow the business. So that's what we did. We still took on venture capital. I have great venture capitalists behind yeah. us. Where I was wrong isn't, and I'm the first one to admit when I was wrong, mm -hmm. is that article came out in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was three years ago, yeah. I was three years off. Because you ask any venture capital today. firm today about profitability, and they'll say, we can't wait. Oh, every single um, venture capital, like Y Combinator and Dreesen Horowitz, if everybody you saw that YC article. Oh my God, it's So crazy. I was just three years off. Yeah, but I mean, you were, listen, uh, the, as I say, the clock is wrong uh, t two times a day. I can't remember how the saying goes, but um, clearly cycles, I mean, Ray Dalio talks about it as well in general, not just about like fun evaluations and so on, but when, every, when, 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 when the world's going crazy, everybody's just going to follow foot. And then when the world hits a reality check like we are in right now, um, you realize the importance of camels over unicorns. And, and the problem is not so much just like the fact that this is like, what, what are the implications of overly inflated valuations and generous venture capital money? The problem there is you end up becoming a founder of a company that raises money at a ridiculous valuation. And now you cannot continue because you, you, you know, you're you either going to take a down round that's just going to take your motivation completely down the drain because you are left with no equity. You're just going to get diluted to like nothing. Um, or you're going to get like a hostile takeover. Um, so th so it, it just sets up a, a founder to, for failure when they go, and, like this thing about like, I just raised $15 million at 75 million valuation off of a pitch deck or a little bit of traction is admirable. It's celebrated. And actually it should be because that's, it all shows that people are believing in you. But it's, it's uh, a little bit of a kind of a, 
the opposite of what they say is a blessing in disguise. It's it's a it's a disaster in disguise. I think <laughs> one of the reasons potentially I, at least one of the reasons I love working with the the, the venture capital firms that have invested in seafood soup and it's you actually look at them and you'll understand this. Yeah, is they're all ex entrepreneurs. Right, so they know exactly what they're getting themselves into. Because I think that, you know, it's it's funny because I was an investor before I was an entrepreneur, so I see it from the other side. Yeah. I know how long it takes to make money. Yeah. I know how long it takes, how much risk. The one thing I haven't told you about is the six failed companies that we started. Yeah. Yeah, like I had a music studio at one point that I thought was going to be a business. I started another food trade company. I had a co-working space just before COVID. Like, there are so many failures, right? But I learned how much money you need to lose. I had a whistleblowing app. Amazing. Yeah. A whistleblowing app? Yeah, yeah whistleblowing. Like, like for compliance. Oh, of course. I remember that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like if somebody's getting bribed, for example. Correct. That there was like a, a way to like whistleblow. And like, so there was all these things that I tried. <laughs> um, interestingly, the, all the businesses that have been doing well, all related to the ocean. Now, is that reductive? <laughs> is it like, well, it happened to be, or have I been paying more attention to them and focusing more of my effort on them? That's a, that's a, it's that's very a hard to distinguish <laughs> between how much luck and how much uh, wisdom or expertise uh, come together. Uh, I, I mean, I could, I could, argue, I could make the argument that every successful person is entirely lucky, but of course you can always point your finger at something they've done and failures they've done that taught them. I mean, but I think trying to solve that f philosophical debate is, is, is a moot point anyway. Like, what's the point? Like, you know, you are where you are successful, thank, uh, mashallah alaik, um, with, uh, with the seafood souk. Um, but the truth is failure, you know what's the best part about failure? And as somebody who also had a startup that failed and the startup that I have today, thankfully, is doing very well, is that um, basically it teaches you not not just the, uh, how to run a business and what how to make it grow and how to uh, succeed, but it teaches you that failure is not so bad. And I, you know, like, 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 so what you fail. So why right? do we call it a startup? Yeah. Why did, when did we stop calling it a business? By the way, real quick on the NBA, because I think I haven't addressed my NBA jersey. Yeah, I was going to ask you. So, uh, yes, now it's my turn to interview. <laughs> why the NBA jersey? Yeah. And they're different every time. Yeah, yeah. So, quick tangent as to add our topic um, it's the NBA playoffs. I'm an NBA freak, basically. Um, Miami just got. Uh, they lost against uh, Boston, but they 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 did very well. Game seven uh, just yesterday. So this is Bam Adebayo's jersey. So um, during the NBA playoff season, I'm wearing NBA jerseys. I have like I think 15 of them. Uh, and once the NBA playoffs are done, I'm going back to regular attire, which is <laughs> t-shirts and other like informal <laughs> clothing. But yeah, that's just basically NBA playoff season. Okay, so, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's just that's. Yeah. But back to the startup thing. Um, I am, for example, my company is successful. But I am in it for zero impact and 100% the fact that it happens to make, to do well financially. Uh, and actually, that's why I grapple with this company and why I'm unable, to, I mean, I don't need to grow it beyond what it is because it does well as it is. It's a bit of a mom and pop shop. Um, you know, it's easy to, you know, make immediate cash. We have zero overhead. It's the le most lean operation in the world. But if you ask me as somebody who left management consulting, very grateful for everything I've learned and the years that I spent there, I didn't leave consulting to become like a, uh, to, start, to start another kind of consulting startup, whatever. Like, I don't care, <laughs> you know, about the problem that I'm solving at all, <laughs> to be but honest. You, but, but if I can ask you. But you, I'm just you, good at it. <laughs> but, no, because you identified it when you were there. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? I think, you know, if you look I at... I saw an opportunity, basically. But that, yeah. So for me, there's this, there's these concentric circles, right? Mm. Uh, for you to be an expert, to be knowledgeable in a field, mm. there's, there's what you know. Yeah. Right? what you've kind of experienced yeah. and what you think is going to happen. Yeah. And when you meet those three together at the, at the intersect of that Venn diagram, yeah. if you can make that work. So we didn't start Seafood Souk knowing that Seaspiracy was going to be created. Yeah. But my experience was... Seaspiracy, I love that. By right, it was a great, great, great documentary. But the point is, is that when, 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 the lift, when the lid was lifted on the seafood industry, we'd started the business three years before that. Okay, sorry, go back for a second. Sea Spiracy is a documentary? It's a documentary. You've got to watch it if you haven't seen it. Oh, okay. You started the documentary? No, no, no. Oh. Ali Tabrizi. He's like a very famous documentary guy. Okay. Uh, lifted the lid on the issues in the fishing industry. The illegal uh, hunting. Yeah, yeah, illegal okay. fishing, yeah, yeah, bad yeah. fish farms, stuck and all the rest of it. Right. Um, you know, we started a supply chain company way before people were talking about the issues in the supply chain. You know, when people are coming to us today and talking to us about, you know, the global supply chain issues, like we've been in this for four years. You've seen it. We Not only did we see it, we thought there was going to be a problem. Yeah. And that's the prediction. For you, with QOC, yeah. 
you had been in the industry. Yeah. You knew that there was an opportunity to kind of break the model. Yeah. You knew it from the client side because friends of ours went off to become clients trying to hire firms. That's right. I was a freelancer at first, one point myself. And yeah. you, you sat there and you went, wow, if I could do this better. Yeah, actually, it started off as a side hustle for the first company. As the first company that I was passionate about, I had all, I, w I really wanted to disrupt social media, um, create a better place for online discourse. You know, I was, and by the way, at that period of my time, sure, I was in New York, I was younger, all that stuff, but I was at my best state of feeding the life force of that i want to solve that problem i want to create a big company and then you know as a company was shutting down three years later qoc was just a side hustle it was never meant to become a company and thank god it turned out to be a great company but i never decided to grow it with the idea that i'm passionate about the problem i'm solving and so this was an in full disclosure i grapple with this i go through existential crisis i sit there with with the irony that you know you know again i don't want to you know you know, humble brag or brag at all, but like it, it does well financially, um, quite well actually. But the irony is that no matter how well it does financially, I don't care about the impact. Like I don't. Have you thought about what impact you're creating? Like if I ask you now, what impact do you create with QOC? I mean, I'm I'm st I'm staffing the top of the pyramid executives to the most expensive companies, right? So so the 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 ones who need the jobs the least are the ones that I'm staffing. To the client, to the companies that are the most well off, right? So, so, so the the most impact I'm creating is look. Let me let me to be fair. I am changing ca careers of people who are making say seventy thousand dollars a year are now making two hundred thousand dollars a year because I helped create that bridge, right? And and those who triple their annual salary in one go because I managed to connect those two people. It's it feels great. I'm not gonna sit there and be like, but I didn't. I'm not like that's not why I go to I do work. I don't wake up to try to change people's careers. I, I, no matter how much I try to tell myself that this is what I'm doing, the truth is I'll close. A, I'll broker a talent deal, uh, which is what I'm doing. Um, wherever it falls, when whatever happens to me, if you want to get somebody that is the Harvard McKinsey making two thousand five hundred dollars a day person, I'll help you get that person. Um, and so there's very little impact that I'm doing there by just speeding up the process of the Let me high change your time. thought on that. Let me change yeah. your thought on that, right? So there was a point in time when, and we'll get onto this, where we thought Seafood Took wasn't going to make it. Yeah. And my political life, I think, will one day come to an end. Yeah. Just because it's the nature of things. There's nothing sinister or bad about it. Yeah. And my wife and I want to retire on a yacht. And I always thought to myself, well, Your wife's from New Zealand. From New Zealand. And yeah. I thought, what am I going to do? Like, what could I do? Yeah. I have what I know, which is I'm a political economist by education and I've worked in trade relations and supply chains for most of my life. Mm -hmm. From c consulting into building industries with Mubadara into, you know, what I'm doing now. And if I was to think like where my skill sets are of what I know, that's what it is. Mm. Then I have my network, right? What I've done, my experience has very much been Middle East based. Mm. And then there's what I think is going to happen, which is what I hope my value add is, right? People like you and me, we don't know how to fix cars. We don't know how to fix people. We're not doctors. The only thing we have is what's up here. Sure. And if we lie to that and we're not being honest with our advice, yeah. then we have zero value in the world. That's right. So we're very, very conscious of the fact we have that advice. Yeah. I had no idea what I was going to do. Because I actually said, I'm going to retire, but I'm going to be bored. I would still want to work, but yeah. on my own time. On my own terms. Why? Because I want to be close to my kids. Right, because you have two of them. I've got twin boys. Mashallah. The answer for me, because I'm on the group, was I would put my CV forward to QLC for these projects. So when you think about your impact... Oh, why? To make money? No, to have the flexibility. I mean, for one, it's intellectual stimulation. Right. I think if you... Or mental I, masturbation, as I you don't think, call it. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I would ever stop working. Yeah. Right? In that, and I'd love, always love to, to advise. I would love yeah. to advise, right? Uh, advisory. But I wouldn't be able to do that... If I didn't exist to help you get those gigs, let's say. As and easily. And spend time with my kids. And also, so I uh, hear what you're saying. So be very cautious when you stop your impact of what you've done. Like if you follow the chain down to maybe a young parent, male or female, that is now saying, look, I need to take some time out of work. Maybe there's a difficult situation, but I can still earn part time doing a project and be paid more. So be very cautious I, I, about saying that you don't make that kind of impact. You're very right about using the right context because I have a ton of stories of people who have managed to buy land in Portugal and become farmers and that was their dream because now they're able to take gigs. So I look there are I might be getting I can be hard on myself sometimes because there are incredible case studies around me uh, that have that I have managed to play a role in meddling to make them happen. So thank God for the outcomes. Um, I managed to make some money they manage to get the life they want. So there's no shortage of these stories. 
But I'd be lying to myself if I say this is why I go to work every day. But can I then uh, take the impact one step further? Uh, and and but one interesting story that I want to mention because there's this guy on Upwork, um, and this story every time I remember this particular story, um, I get I get energized about QOC um, because this guy. So there's uh, one of the consulting companies wanted a um, tab, Tableau is this like software you use to do dashboards and stuff, and they didn't have that expertise in their company. And so they came to us, they're like, look, and these guys, of course, they pay thousands of dollars a day. They're like, we need a Tableau developer, expert type guy. You know, we know this is, might not be within your vicinity. Could you help us find that person? On Upwork, little, do, you know, did this consulting know, or maybe they didn't have the time. These guys exist in Belarus and Serbia. Like they are paid 20 bucks an hour, but they are the best at that stuff. Managed to get that guy a job. He was making about $40,000 a year suddenly started making $300,000 a year. This is, he literally set six, seven X'd his income off of a phone call. I called him. He was just as high caliber as the client needed him to be. He knew Tableau and his life changed. In a, he, he literally won the lottery. Within one month, his entire life changed. So every time I think about the story, because he keeps getting in touch and thanks me. And I was like, listen, man, I mean, I, I just was just doing my job, you know. Um, I, I think about the impact that I created. It's just that I don't go to work thinking let me go and change people's lives but i happen to do it as a byproduct but 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 that's to your point it's the context it's a monday night yeah we're sitting here drinking tea chatting yeah when we were in consulting do you ever think on a monday night we'd be sitting here drinking tea chatting no so the impact you create is also on your own life that's right this podcast is actually an outcome of it you're absolutely right so i think you know when i when i when i try to be very reflective and i think introspective about one's own life is that you have to sometimes be extremely grateful for the impact I'm having made on yourself because that yeah. then allows us to have these conversations. You That's allow right. me to share my stories. Yeah. Um, you allow yourself to do the things that you love. Other yeah. people, you know. So I, I always tell people that, you know, sometimes it's relative. Sometimes it, it's being a bit more introspective. But I would be very cautious to say that you don't have impact. Maybe you just need to find You're right. Out. No, I don't. You're absolutely right. And by the way, thank I did not expect to get therapy uh, as I'm getting right now because <laughs> this is very therapeutic, actually. Believe it or not, as, as somebody who sometimes grapples with, like, why am I even doing th- what I'm doing? This is recontextualizing to me as I sometimes do. But, but sometimes you need a friend to remind you of and to recontextualize uh, a cup half empty to a cup half full. And actually, this podcast was born of abundance of time, of availability. And I'm able to actually enjoy my passion, which is to converse with people, get curious again. And, and get it to sit down and have some tea with some uh, old friends. So you're right. And and again, I don't. I think I owe you 200 pounds after this for, uh, <laughs> session, as I usually pay my therapist. But uh, <laughs> you're absolutely right. But um, speaking of the fact that you might mentioning that um, you are, so you, you're probably the most one of the most progressive liberal Emiratis I know. Uh, I knew you as a colleague. Um, you have a German mother. Um, I imagine also being uh, part of the royal family, also having um, official positions in the government. So you are the executive chairman of the Department of Government Relations of Sharjah. Mm -hmm. Um, To what extent is it generally a challenge or an advantage, the fact that you have those connections, but at the same time you have a clear foot in the private, like in the more regular life, but also clearly you have a role to play in the government and also as a, a representative of the royal family in one way or another. Yeah, I think the the story with Sharjah, you know, my hometown is 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 one that is still uh, something that I, I I still don't believe. I have to pinch myself that this is my life. I was working at the time for the Abu Dhabi government. I had um, this role monitoring the state-owned portfolio of Abu Dhabi, specifically supply chain companies. So the airport, the ports. Um, and I had had a great time, and I, I, I was living there, and I thought that was going to be my career. And then in 2014, it was on my birthday, I'll never forget, I got the call. Right? The call that changed your life. Um, and it was His Highness the Ruler, and he said, Faham, Abaka Abu from Majestemfidi from Sharjah. You know, so I the ruler of Sharjah, who's your uncle? Who's my uncle, called me up and said, I want you to be this. And and for me, completely out of the blue. Like, was not prepared, had never applied for the job. I was... Do I send him my CV? You what know, year was this? 2014. Okay. January 16th, 2014. It was actually my birthday. You remember your day. Okay. <laughs> it was my birthday. Like literally it was my actual birthday. Right. <laughs> I thought he was calling to wish me happy birthday. Maybe, uh, maybe was that like, was the gift he was yeah, giving. It was like maybe 28 <laughs> is when they call you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
All right. And I was I was an, an angel I was an angel investor at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. I only had time to invest in companies and sort of advise them on on you know maybe some efficiencies and, and help with them financial planning and things like that. Right. And I uh, was made aware of the fact that His Highness had this plan to create an international cooperation office at the local government level, and he wanted me to lead it. Spoiler alert, I didn't speak Arabic. Right. I started learning Arabic in 2013. This was 2014. Yeah, I remember at Kearney, you, I spoke to you only in English. Everybody only you speaks You spoke a bit of Arabic, hardly. Like, no. Like, I know it was, it was always like, Salam alaikum, ismi faham, bas mama min almanya, ma kalam arabi. <laughs> so true. It was. Really, this yeah. was my, I couldn't read, couldn't write, uh, you oh, know. Man. Um, but I had gone, I just started this journey learning Arabic. Yeah. Um, and this part, I'll just to prove that I speak Arabic now. فَكَدَمْنِ اسْمُ الْحَاكَمْ وَعَطْلَانِ الْفُرْصَ وَقَدْ أَبَاكَ عُضُو فِي الْمَجْزِ تَنْفِيذِي بعد ذلك أباك تأسس دائرة العلاقات الحكومية في إمارة الشارقة كواجهة أو بوابة دبلوماسية بين الإمارات أو بين إمارة الشارقة والعالم الدولي باعتبارك أنت شخص تحكي بالإنجليزي وإلك كممثل سمو شخصيا والحكومة في المحافل الدولية wow. So I was like, okay, let's do this I speak German and French, right, as well So oh I was God. diplomat at large uh, So I went off on this journey of I guess I to, to a certain extent entrepreneurship. <laughs> well, not entrepreneurship, but it was definitely a startup because this department didn't exist. Mm. Now, let's be honest. This is where I was lucky. I had an uncle who trusted me and knew how to send me down a path with some guardrails. Right. Clean slate. Ask a 28-year-old today to create an international cooperation office. Yeah. And I said, Your Highness, on, on like one condition that I ask. He said, what's that? And I said, let me hire the people that I want. Yeah. And I only hired people straight out of university. So you can mold them your way. Not mold them. I don't want to mold them my way. But you want the ambition, I guess. The no, I just wanted new ideas. Right. Oh, okay. I see. And I go back to the only thing that we have as value to the world is the way that we think and the way that we advise or the things that we say. Sure. So I wasn't going to lie to that. So I've been shot down many times by yeah. the government on, on new ideas. Yeah. But it was very much, how can I change the way diplomacy is kind of done? Yeah. Uh, and that today is what we call small state diplomacy. Small state diplomacy is not reducing Sharjah to, to the idea of it being small. But when I work across the globe, you suddenly realize at a local government level that foreign policy is off the table. Yeah. That, you know, I, I was recently came back from Guatemala. Wonderful country. Please go see it. Yeah. Uh, and I was speaking to the president. I was having a presidential dinner. So I think who at my age gets to have presidential dinners? I'm so blessed. Like... You know, it, you had I'm, dinner with the president of Guatemala. Yeah, and Costa Rica as well. Like, and we, I was I went to Costa Rica and Guatemala. Like, okay. I have a very, very interesting life, and I'm very, very fortunate. I'm very thankful for for the opportunities. Um, and I don't go there pretending that I know more than I do. Like, I'm yeah. the first one to admit. I'm like, Mr. President, like, I know people my age don't get to sit and talk to you. Like, so please, this is a learning experience. Like, let me learn from you. So, small state diplomacy is when I when I sat down and I said this specifically to the president of Guatemala, where I said, Mr. President. With all due respect, Guatemala is not going to have a massive influence on Middle Eastern geopolitics. Right. And neither is the UAE, specifically Sharjah, going to have a say tomorrow on Central American geopolitics. Were you going on an economic mission to build? It was very much a fact-finding mission. Okay. It was a presidential invite. Right. So I went over there to see the country. And I said, well, because of that, we can actually take all the hard stuff off the table. And let's talk about cultural diplomacy. Let's talk about economic diplomacy. Let's talk about educational diplomacy. And we began crafting ideas on how I could bring Guatemala close to Sharjah. And, and the ideas are, like, when you actually take the hard stuff off the table, small state diplomacy is the way forward for the world. Because there is probably a UAE ambassador in Guatemala. or nope. Oh, because they're, they're small states, right? So, so then in small state diplomacy, I ended up having a presidential discussion about cardamom supply chains. Cardamom. Like like uh, in, in Arabic, what do you call it? Al hail. Al hail. Fascinating. I speak Arabic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can actually you knew the word, but I forgot it. But uh, that's incredible because you're good at coffee and and, hay and and cardamom and that stuff. You're seventy five percent of Guatemala's exports come to the UAE already. So who officially today? Uh, like, if I am an Emirati in Guatemala and I need to go to the embassy, like, is there no? Uh, the closest embassy is in. There's one in Costa Rica. There's one in Mexico. Right. Uh, Fascinating. Okay, so let's talk about Georgia. 
my father was on the podcast. Uh, I don't know if you saw that episode. And it's act- by the way, uh, uh, since you do understand Arabic, this is probably one of my favorite episodes on the podcast because my dad um, interviewed Sheikh Zayed. Uh, I'm not watching the Rolex that Sheikh Zayed, may he rest in peace, gave my father after that interview, but it was right before the founding of the UAE. So it's my dad, 82 years old, sitting here about a year ago, uh, less than a year ago, talking about how he moved around from Abu Dhabi. Well, at the time, Sheikh Zayed was living in Al Ain, um, then goes to Abu Dhabi and, and, and basically it goes to the zoo and meets all the animals that Sheikh Zayed had and then goes to uh, Umm Al-Qawain and Sharjah. And he talks about how he ended up having a chat with whoever at the time I think was the ruler. I don't know if it was, uh, I can't remember who it was in 1970, before the founding of the UAE. And it's just fascinating to hear from uh, somebody, my father, who's at the time, by the way, was a political editor of a Riyadh newspaper in Saudi. So that's why he was there on a mission. And so his journalistic uh, endeavor uh, was one of the reasons that, or has contributed in some way to the, um, you know, the, the recognition of the UAE by the, Saudi, by the Saudis and also the founding of the UAE. So, so it's an interesting episode. But the reason I mentioned it is because when he talks about Sharjah, he describes it like when it was like, I mean, the, all of the UAE had nothing but desert and a few buildings. Even Dubai had just Dera and one hotel, the Carlton. Um, and so here you are. So there, there, I have the perspective of Sharjah from my father. Then I know Sharjah today. But what's coming for Sharjah? What's the vision? Um, from As somebody who is in your role uh, in the government of Sharjah and yep. working with uh, His Highness, so like... Um, What's coming? So there, there's a few things. So one thing that I did, and once again, my, my time in consulting sort of helped this, was you know when I arrived and I was having a discussion with, at the time, the, pol- the communications director for 10 Downing Street in the UK. Which is what exactly? So the 10 Downing Street, the home of the prime minister. Oh, okay. So the office of the prime minister, their communications director. Uh-huh. And he was there for a conference and we were chatting. And he said, fine, you know, talk to me about... Sharjah and we were explaining it and, and everything that we do and I was talking that Sharjah is really strong on culture we have the largest number of museums we have a very active cultural economy we're amazing at u- education nobody trumps us on education we are you know with the American University of Sharjah the University of Sharjah we're educating right. the region yeah. um, we're still a, a very important logistics hub um, but you know we were talking about the fact that on the back of education we're going into this innovation space and and, and really doing research and development rather than just startups, right? If you actually want to do applied research and development, engineering, like Sharjah is the place to be. And I was looking for cities like Sharjah around the world, right? So out of the capital cities. So in, in France, I was speaking to Marseille. I was speaking to, to um, Lyon in Russia, which we don't talk about anymore, but we were speaking <laughs> to, you know, St. Petersburg. Yeah. In India, I was speaking to... Um, uh, I, w- I was speaking to uh, uh, Kerala, and you know, we were we were sort of looking at in the U.S. It was Boston, right? Right. And that's how I started telling people. You know, I said, "Look, Abu Dhabi is is Washington D.C. and Texas, right? It's the political capital and it's the energy capital. Yeah, Dubai is like half L.A., half Miami, sort of a third L.A., a third Miami, a third New York, yeah. right? If it needs to be, right? It's this entertainment capital." Extremely important logistics hub, hub yeah. for the region, but also the financial capital. Right. And I said, Sharjah's Boston. We have the two best universities Good in the analogy. region. Good yeah. analogy. Right? So, and then people could contextualize it. I did the same in the UK. I said it was Cambridge. Uh. So people started to see like, oh, okay, I understand it. And then I went to his highness and I said, your highness, I think we need to change our message around the world. He needs to go off and do it. So I went off going around the world saying that Sharjah is the UAE's capital of culture, education, and innovation. Yeah. And it rolls off the tongue. Right. Watch any interview. I say it. Yeah. And I knew that it stuck when his highness was sitting with a political delegate. I will mention who. And that person was asking his highness about Sharjah. And his highness turned to the gentleman and said, Sharjah is the capital of culture, education and innovation. And that's when I knew that what was coming for Sharjah was extremely concrete. Yeah, and they have this like accelerator programs now, the media. Yeah, look, Sharjah has young people and it has the best education. Yeah. Off the back of that, we can build so much. Yeah. So what, what do I say? The, 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 so let me, let me give it to you on two levels. Yeah. Culture, education, innovation is a very strong message to basically if you're in the cultural space, you're in education or leaving education to do real innovation, yeah. you have to do it in Sharjah. Yeah. Because there is the ecosystem, there's a critical mass. 
and you can't build the 45,000 students that we have in Sharjah overnight. It took us since the 90s. And now it exists. University yeah. City, it's amazing. Yeah. The other side of the key strategic sectors where we've won, one of them is publishing. Mm. Like Sharjah is the publishing hub for the region. Especially, and I'll say this only with friends on this podcast, but a lot of people don't understand that on the back of political turmoil across the Middle East, there's no safe haven for Arab publishing. The traditional capitals have gone through some very, very turbulent times politically. Yeah, there was no way back. So therefore we needed to provide another safe haven and charge is that safe haven. And if you look at what charge is doing in the publishing world, we have the third largest book fair in the world. Last year it was the largest. Right. Fair enough. And, right. and so the other industry, if you allow me, very yeah, quickly, of course, of course, is BIA. BIA is the region's leading environmental services company. Charge is zero waste to landfill. Nobody talks about it in public. We should talk about it more. Charge company manages waste management for Medina in Saudi Arabia and the new administrative capital in Cairo. So it's sustainability focused basically. Yeah, it's a circular economy play where we can actually stop landfill. Yeah. So Charge is very good at certain things. Yeah. And we go out there and do it. The one thing we don't do, and we've always been taught to, is to remain very humble about it and not shout from the rooftops. Yeah. But then if you think about the UAE in general, because I'm sure you're also exposed to all the things that are going on and how progressive this country is getting and how it's evolving. And thank God for this country, by the way. I mean, somebody who came out of Jordan and was lucky enough to land a job in after university in AUB, um, we were tra chatting earlier about how blessed we are to be in this country that only gets better and better. Um, and I could never, I mean, I, I lived in New York, I lived in SF, obviously I lived in Jordan when I was younger. Um, but Dubai, in pre before the last couple of years, was a place where I always thought, like, I'll come here, I'll start a career, I'll make some money, save money, eventually go somewhere else. But we were chatting earlier about how this entire country is becoming a place that you actually love being in. The weather is hot in the summer, but that's basically it. I have zero complaints about this country. I have nothing, but, and I'm not, there's no way, I'm not trying to do like positive PR, I'm not getting paid by the government. Like, this is truly my personal opinion as somebody who has lived in all those places. What's to hate about the United Arab Emirates, especially Dubai where I'm living? But also, I mean, oh sure, I mean, all the Emirates have different, are, are on different paths, but for all intents and purposes, this country is on a pedestal in every single way. Um, and so I have two questions for you here. Like, do you have any particular interesting stories or insights that you're able to share that are not confidential about how this country keeps its place uh, spearheading the entire region and the world, actually, for that matter, in being what it is and what goes on for it to be where it is? And the second question to that is, you know, they talk a lot about Saudi Arabia and the renaissance of Saudi Arabia. Do you think that we might find ourselves in a point in 10 years from now where people want to leave Dubai and live in Saudi? Um, is this something that you can comment on? Um, so two very small questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for <laughs> minor, about <laughs> minor side notes here. <laughs> yeah, then I'll really get involved in this. No. Um, so the one thing you'll learn is that when you get me in an environment like this where I'm, I'm out of my candora and we get to chat and you wanted to talk to me about startups, we talk right. about this stuff, is that for a second, let me take off my hat as um, Sharjah's diplomat at large. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me talk to you as Fahim, right, your friend. Yeah. I'll answer these questions as the political economist that I was taught to be. And for a second, uh, picture me being back at Cambridge, sitting in you know, uh, a lecture hall, working through these ideas, because that's what actually happened. Right. You went to Cambridge? I went to Cambridge. Oh, okay. So, uh, thank you. It's a wonderful place where you actually get to work this muscle that we call our brain. Yeah. The, the UAE does one thing very, very well. Yeah. And that's really what the core role of government is. And I think a lot of people forget this. What is the core role of government? policy making yeah and swift policy making experimental policy making is something that the uae does very quickly the way in which the policy cycle works here compared to other places is very very different please do not interpret that as a lack of bureaucracy because there is a bureaucracy as there exists in every government around the world yeah but the way in which we issue policy for the interest of the country is far swifter and more informed than other places in the world yeah COVID was a great example. And a lot of people, uh, my mom, here's a story that I can't tell you. My mom left Germany to come here to get vaccinated. My mom is German. She lives in Germany. 
She still has her residency here, but she lives between here and Germany. And she said to me, she lived here for 40 years. She's like, never in the 40 years that I lived here did I ever think I would leave Germany to come to the UAE for better health care. Mm. Why was the UAE so successful at managing COVID? Small state, digitally enabled, great logistics, period. Vaccines came in. They went to the airport. They went from the airport to three locations. Everybody was digitally enabled. The entire population got vaccinated. Mm. Germany took me four hours to register my grandma. Well, my mom to register so my. So Germany is more bureaucratic, and not only bureaucratic, but it's a large country. Like the supply chain of sending, people, you know, and and, and yeah, yeah and, to, and to to supply, you know, vaccines to the village that we live in, which is ten thousand people. Like it's difficult. Sure, sure, yeah. So when you're making policies for a country as nimble and as agile as we are, you know, we talk about agile in business. Like think about agile in policymaking. Sure, right? you know, that's yeah. that's where the UAE is very strong. But. As a political economist, when I was when I was sort of thinking through this, I actually thought about the political economy of the UAE. Mm. Follow this thread. It's very contentious. I'm being maybe a little bit, you know, it's a bit of intellectual pontification, which is a word we loved using, right? Which is just thinking for the sake of thinking. The UAE was heavily reliant on oil. Still is, to a certain extent, reliant on oil exports. I would love for sure. We took those petrol dollars and built industry. But those industries, that economy that we built, what do you need for an economy? Labor and capital. Yeah, demand and supply. What we didn't have, we had the capital, we didn't have the labor. Right. And we couldn't produce it quick enough. So what did we do? We allowed people to come to this country. Yeah. And people came in. Yeah. They became part of our economy. Yeah. Tax-free. What we needed them to was to run our factories. Yeah. To drive our taxis to do our comms, to be our talent, you know, headhunters. Sure, yeah. And what they asked was, they said, you know, like, okay, well, that's how we built the economy. This is very much an economic question. As you do that, you get to the point where the UAE, where 80% of the population is actually resident and not national. So we've actually built an economy that has diversified away from oil, mm. but it's still heavily reliant on people from around the world coming here to, to run this economy. Right, and creating a lifestyle for them that would be attractive too. Well, this is the point. Now you need to protect that extremely important part of your economy. The sure. UAE is the first government that will put its hand up and say what is extremely important to our economy is that we want people to come here and be successful mm -hmm. because that makes us successful. So yeah. the policies that we create are not for the 20% Emiratis. Yeah. The policies we create are for 80% of people that come from all around the world. And as long as that is front of mind, the economists in government will continue to encourage this country to protect always the fact that everybody here feels welcome. And I can tell you this from being at a, you know, at a high school here in the UAE. You know, my wife is from New Zealand. We were in high school together. Right. I have friends from like 30 countries in the world. Yeah. Most of them because they're like, I have 15 friends only, but like, <laughs> but, but they're half, half, you know? Sure, so, sure, you know, sure. my point is, is that there's this understanding of this beautiful um, internationalism that exists. And it's very different to an internationalism that exists in New York. And I'll give you this like anecdote that proves it. Yeah. I went to New York for my first time to the UN and I was alone there for work. So I was walking around the street and I did the very Fahim extrovert thing, which is go around and ask people Dubai style questions. Dubai style questions? Yeah, yeah. So like, hi, I'm Fahim, nice to meet you. Oh, yeah. And I'd ask a question like, where are you from? And they would look at me stupidly and be like, I'm from New York. Oh, wow. And I was like, wow, New York has its own international identity. Like yeah. if you could issue passports from New York, people would take it from New York. Versus the debate question or the UAE question is like, hey, where are you from? Well, I'm originally from here, but I grew up because it's a beautiful story that you get to share your sure, story. Sure, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a very Bedouin. Like if you think about the art culture, it's actually also very. We're all travelers. We all have a story to tell. Yeah. My kids are gonna say, well, my dad's half Emirati, half German. My mom is from New Zealand, but she moved to the UAE in '94 and. They lived there and I grew up there, but my summers I spent in Germany and New Zealand. You know, there's this beautiful internationalism that we celebrate. It's not yeah. celebrated in other parts of the world because when you go to New York, you adopt, I'm from New York. Yeah, it's, it's the melting pot of all melting pots. I mean, New York just sort of happened. Um, I don't think it had like vision first and outcome second. I think it just sort of happened uh, post-World War II, all that stuff, you know, uh, Financial markets, I don't know. I think, but it is great in its own way. I love New York. I think it might still be my favorite city just because it's so neurotic and everybody's got an exciting story. And for anybody that is an extrovert or wants to do something crazy, you go to New York and you're just constantly inspired. But Dubai is becoming like that. 
Dubai is starting to become between the crypto hub that they're starting to, I mean, the UAE in general, right? Like, I think I see, because I work with um, government entities and private sector entities and family offices across the uh, United Arab Emirates. And I see the progressiveness and the evolution happening on an accelerated level across sectors, across industries, in a way that is so inspiring and um, uh, can only remind me of, uh, or let me put it to you this way. I look at uh, also inspiring, you know, countries in the world, including adjacent countries. And maybe I'm not, from my vantage point, unable to see the vision uh, from where I'm standing right now, but I can't, in my right mind, imagine, uh, like, and I, I'm specifically referring to, like, the, the, the adjacent countries catching up to what Dubai has managed to achieve in such a short period of time. Capital, there is an abundance of capital. There is no shortage of capital. Um, there is no shortage of vision either. Like, and again, I'll talk about Saudi Arabia. MBS, extremely visionary. What he's done for Saudi Arabia, I mean, let's leave politics aside, is incredible. Like, what you're seeing just the last two years between, you know, empowerment of women and, and just what's going on, it's fascinating. It's super impressive. Um, and, and, and everybody that goes to Saudi, consultants especially, and, and, and everybody else that lives there tells you what's going on in Saudi is refreshing, is empowering, is great. Um, but like there's something about the UAE that I can't help but always realize there is always something in their arsenal in the UAE to keep them as if like like this country, is, I feel safe, man. I feel secure. I, my door is unlocked all the time. I never need to feel like I need to lock the door of my house. Um, I feel this is home, even though I don't have an Emirati passport. Look, I think there's there's a unique thing once again because the once again I'll answer as a you know economist. So uh, let me. I'm not deflecting the question on Saudi Arabia. I'm, I'm asking a far more macro level question. Sure. Uh, do you think when China was developing or Indonesia is expanding or Japan is working on its economic policies? That they talk about, like, uh, can we can we build an economy if China's building an economy? Yeah, can you know? Do you think do you think Indonesia sits there and go, well, Malaysia's doing this? Do we have space to also build an economy? Yeah, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Yeah. Therefore, you have to maybe start the entire hypothesis with one very simple question: Can we uplift the entire region? Yeah. And if the answer to that is yes, then we hope Saudi Arabia and the kingdom and its wonderful people succeed in what they're doing. Because then it'll lift the economy of the entire region. Because there is a collective space. almost. Th there is space for it. If they build their own economy, that's that's a bigger market for us. And if we continue to grow, that's a market yeah, for them so to. One address. plus one equals three type thing. Yeah, I think I don't think there's this discussion of like you competition know, it, between it, there's the no states. Z, you know there's a there's no there's no zero sum game here that if they win we lose we win they lose it's and I think that is very much developed by the media. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people are still questioning the the uh, trying to attract talent. Because the immediate talent that you can attract is from each other. Right. But and when we, when we were in consulting, we had a young Saudi Arabian gentleman that worked with us. And he was working out of the Dubai office. Yeah. And, and let, me take, let me take you back. You talked to me about your dad. I'll tell me to my granddad. Yeah. My grandfather, who was the brother of the previous ruler of, uh, of, of Sharjah, worked in Saudi. Because back then it was where the jobs were. Sure. There was no question about where I was from. He was a member. He was a brother of the emir yeah. of Sharjah. The ruler. The hakim. Yeah. And he worked in Saudi Arabia. My dad lived his upbringing in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Like there is no, there was never a discussion. Like for us, I hope that it doesn't mean we have to try to, 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 to take from the same pool of talent. I think there's a lot of talent in the world that would move to the Middle East if there was economic opportunity. And therefore, I think that we have to stop having this narrative yeah. that Saudi's trying to take us on. Saudi is a huge co country, much bigger than ours, that has existed. China exists, and so does Singapore. Yeah. You know, this is my analogy that I always use. Yeah. Egypt it's exists. A good one, by the way. Egypt exists, and so do we. And we never sit there comparing ourselves to Egypt. So just because we both wear kandoras or thobes, like now we're in competition? Yeah. I don't think that's the case at all. No, and I'll tell you something. It's funny because you're reminding me now of some stories that, uh, and this takes me back to consulting uh, years ago. Uh, where like they would come up with these different indices or an index that compares Saudi to Qatar to UAE to Bahrain, whether it's foreign direct investment or some sort of like competitiveness metric, and and like there was the competition was 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 alive and well. You know, you'd get calls from those countries telling you like 
revise your index. <laughs> like, well, the, 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 uh, you well, might remember those days. I, I, remember, I remember those days, but you know, those were the days when we were trying to get FDI. Right? Yeah. Right. And I think there's, there's a very, very interesting part about that. You know, FDI is, you know, what everybody needs. We need f other people to invest. Foreign, in us, for, foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment. We need other people to invest in our economy for this to work. Yeah. The truth is we don't actually need to be there now. We're, we're net tech, you know, we're net technology importers still in yeah. the region, but we're getting to a point where we export quite a bit. Yeah. We export know-how out of Sharjah, I told you, to, to Egypt, to, to Saudi yeah. Arabia. R&D. You know, there are companies like Karim that export technology across the world from here. You know, mm. so therefore, do we actually need foreign direct investment anymore? We actually have the capital. And especially with technology today, we can actually develop capital in-house. Yeah, but I think the competition was more less about the actual metrics and more about just a little bit of ego ranking. I mean, the problem is, look, the, the, this is not just specific to the GCC. It's a game theory. It's human nature. Um, and, and on some level, it's good to have a sense of competition. But what you were saying earlier, I think, is, 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 is like, you know, you're hitting the nail on the head with wisdom, which is there is a positive outcome for, for, for the region as a whole with putting aside uh, getting ahead of each other at the expense of each other. Let me, let me tell you what, and I say this proudly as an Arab, you know, for, for years there's the question of, you know, where, where do I fit? I'm half European, half Emirati. Yeah. Right, very proud. Yeah. Um, and there was always this, this existential crisis of, you know, who do I have a foot in each door? In the UAE they thought I was a German guy, in Germany they thought I was the Turkish guy. You know, it's very difficult to, yeah. to sort of place yourself. But I've become very proud of, of what this country has done. I'm very proud to, to represent this country. Um, and very proud more than anything to be an entrepreneur in this country. Yeah. Because when people ask me, they say, what are you trying to do at Seafood Circuit? I say, solve the world's oceans. Like, save the world's oceans. And that, 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 that's great. And all the rest of it. What we're actually doing is we're proving something that I don't think had been done before. A lot of people have built... I hate calling it this, but it is... Copycat technology. Local, I've said this publicly. Localized versions of global plays. Yeah. Yeah. Seafood soup does not exist anywhere else in the world. Yeah. We're solving a world problem from the region. That's beautiful. My, our CTO, Osama, Palestinian Jordanian guy, gets yeah. on BBC and speaks in Arabic on BBC Arabic. I have, a, I have an Arab CTO building technology that is changing the world. We were recognized by the United Nations yeah. as a model for sustainably harvesting our oceans. What we're trying to prove today, and the more we prove this, the less we'll worry about competition because it means we can actually put our capital to developing technology for the world and we'll become a net technology exporter. If we get to that in the region, one country manages to do that, game over. We're just as, we will be our own, there's no more EMEA. There will be Europe and there will be Middle East. Wow. Like that is a huge aim that we need to get to. You're actually absolutely right. I don't think there is a single startup um, that was born in the region for the world for the world or that was disruptive or innovative they were they're all local and not not to take away from those who are uh, hustlers and smart enough to take a model and localize it right um, there are actually a lot of arabs that started global disruptive solutions in their own respective cities in silicon valley or other, otherwise so it's not to say that the creativity and the ingenuity and, and and all the things that you need to have in order to be that visionary and smart we have it as people in the region but we sort of get inspired or we get to work or, or we have the ecosystem when we happen for those of us who happen to live in silicon valley or new york to get to work but what is so beautiful about what you're saying and and your your uh, you know uh, your startup basically seafood souk what you're saying is you might be probably and, and I, I really do wish you all the best the, one of the first if not the only if not the first region born startup company solving a global problem but it's born and raised in the region that's beautiful i don't think there are such examples yeah but here's my question let me ask you a question why do you think the arabs go to silicon valley to create their startups there I'll tell you my opinion because I went there for to start my company that was meant to be a globally disruptive company because i felt i needed that ecosystem that didn't exist here i felt what i had here was access to capital in fact i raised my round from angel investors in the region and I packed up my suitcase and I headed off to New York because I felt like New York would be, uh, and, and of course when I say New York, I mean New York in, in, tandem, in tandem with uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, because I spent half and half, um, was going to be the gateway that would accelerate um, the idea if it was to succeed 
to the world because the ecosystem is so that it's, it's almost like a uh, like a like a what, I don't forget the word but the word is like like a you start an idea in, in New York or Silicon Valley and then if it works it's probably the fastest place for it to sure. go global then, from then, there right like then let me double click on on one thing you said there which is yeah. ecosystem it's a gateway to the world basically sure but what's an ecosystem Actually, this is coming Very straight abstract. out of Kearney, Mauricio as well. Like you know, uh, so so funding, R and D, um, uh, mentorship. Uh, uh, there's like I think there, and this is actually coming straight out of a Kearney framework, and I forgot it right now. But I think and at the time it was uh, Anshu Vats and all these guys. Um, but a startup ecosystem has uh, so I think it was funding, R and D, um, mentorship, uh, regulation. Um, access to um, cost market, so market access, and right? Like there's, there's. I think I'm not being collectively exhaustive, or probably even mutually exclusive at this point. But an, e an ecosystem has all those f f yeah. seven, eight things, right? And I think in the region, there is maybe just two or three of them that are abundant: capital and everything else. I think there, it, it, everything else lacks. I mean, so here's let me let me give yeah. you it from the seafood tool perspective. Yeah, capital sort of does exist. Yeah, there's it's no smaller, shortage of dry powder sure, to go there, for. There's capital. And it's easy to raise. As long as you don't do... No, it's never easy to raise. Let's be honest. We nearly ran, about it, ran out of money twice. Like, I've been through the hard trips. If you are not doing the Silicon Valley of death model and you want to make sure that you actually maintain a large stake oh but that's company. because you didn't want to go for the silicon valley death model but yeah. if you wanted to you couldn't ha you could have raised 10 million sure. or 50 million valuation with a cool pitch deck you that's not like the hardest thing to do you know well it was hard because we were trying to change the world and they had never seen the business model before sure sure yeah this wasn't let's localize something international so that was and it's probably different. not a sexiest story like uh, you know what i mean it is like, now it is post conspiracy yeah second um oh wow let's talk about second let's talk about market if you keep trying to just serve the region you'll always have a small market when you solve world problems, you then have the world as your market. Mm. And nobody's doing that here. And not just that. You can access the entire We access the entire world. You know how well we, I mean, this is a real old UAE selling point. Do you know how easy it is to trade between China and the US in fish when you're based here? We're always in somebody's time zone. Yeah. So basic, yet so important. It gives you a huge advantage. Massive advantage. So what is it then? Is it we're, like we're, we're on the phones and, and getting people on the platform in Asia in the morning. And by the time we get to the evening, we're speaking to the guys in the U.S. selling them fish there. Think, so think about that for a second. I, I think uh, you're right. I think it's an un underutilized advantage. But what is it then? Why aren't founders and entrepreneurs in the Middle East, in the UAE, venturing out to solve global problems and instead of they're focusing only on the region? Uh, is this because of a lack of an, an, uh, uh, the, of the foundation of the ecosystem that is needed, or is it lack of vision or lack of inspiration from others who are? Because like solving a problem for the region is big enough, you would think. I mean, if you manage to even succeed at doing that, uh, it's 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 a big success story. Like him or not, I once had the opportunity to have dinner with Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary V. Gary V. Yeah. It was a bigger event. It wasn't just a one on one, but I was there and I. And you know me, the, 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 an, the analyst sort of calls over Gary. I'm like, Gary, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah, sure. I was like, Gary, like, you have an amazing amount of insight when you enter a new market. Like, who does your research? So you've come to the Middle East and you're talking to Arabs like you know what their day-to-day -day life is. And he said two things. The only research I do is what's on platform. So I read comments. And he said, the second thing is, what makes you think that you are so different to the rest of the world? He said, you think young guys here being forced to go to university by their parents when they want to do their own thing is any different to a young kid in Asia or the U.S.? He said, do you think you, think you are that different? He's like, I tap into the humane. Like, I tap into the very human things that make us human. And I, he's like, it's a generational thing. It's not a nationality thing. And it's intuitive. He's so intuitive. And it, it made, I, I hated Gary Vee until I met him. And then I met him, I just realized he was an yeah. extremely intelligent human being. Yeah. And I was like, wow, Gary, like super, super impressed. That's answered my question. So what makes you think that if you're solving a regional problem, you aren't solving a, a global problem? Question one. Question two, if you think that your quickest route to success is taking a proven business model and localize it, then you actually aren't creating a startup because you care. You're creating a startup to create money. Back Which is back full to circle. Back to, to your was, first question. That's right. Yeah. So think about it from that perspective. 
I did not create a startup because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I did not invest in Seafood Souk when we created it to try and exit. We want to solve the world's ocean. And prom I promise you this, Yaza, there will be a day when we have a liquidation event. That's how we call it internally. We don't talk at a, we're going to exit and we're going to retire. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay on and keep working at the company. Yeah. Because I may have different shareholders. I may have partially exited some of my shareholding, but I will still work for this company because I care. But bro, because you are enlightened enough to have identified a problem that is so complex and probably cannot be solved in, in, in not only two, three generations, but, but for it, it's a problem that will continue to need to be solved. And I think you've set up yourself to a, a blessing in disguise, which is a problem that you can dedicate your, a lifetime for and, and still you know, leave it for somebody else to pick up after, uh, inshallah, many, many years. And that's a, that's a great way. Again, this, I'm referring back to the Zina Ajluni episode two episodes ago where, where she spoke about the importance of solving a problem that is large enough um, to dedicate all your life to. And I mean, not to say that you, know, you, can, you can have a diverse life, you can do different things, you can start different companies. Like Elon Musk, I mean, he's, Elon Musk is Elon Musk, right? Let's not say that he's, uh, he's a representative of the average human being, but he's going to Mars, changing vehicles, changing electronic payments, uh, changing human brains, and he's doing it all simultaneously. And none of these problems are simple problems. So it's so important to be true to the impact and the problem that you're solving. Um, and now I'm just starting, since we're talking about consulting, thinking about this classic two-by-two two diagram that I'm sure you remember, which is ease of implementation and impact. And there were four quadrants, right? And every time we would advise a client on like how they should go about solving a problem, we would think about like, you should focus on the ease- Top right-hand corner. Top right-hand corner. <laughs> ease of implementation, high. Impact, high. But then the second priority is, uh, depending on who the client is, you know, maybe the, the harder implementation, but impact is still high. Sometimes that changes. Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs, what they do in the region is, the low hanging fruit is, look, the region, we know the region. Let's start with the region. You know, the region is big enough. We've got 300 million people, 300 million Arabs, I think, if I'm not mistaken, something like yeah, that. Yeah, they say it's about the same size as the US yeah. when you take Arabs. Of course, Arabs. Uh, add the complexity of what you said earlier, which is the, the, the different, the Moroccans are different than the Egyptians. And even though they're in North Africa, different from the Lebanese, different from the Saudis. So it's not one market. Um, so, so, so there's something about the hustle and they need to make money and to get rich and to flip companies that takes away from what otherwise would be a bigger ambition, which is, let's take a step back. The region has a lot of problems to solve, but what if I can dream bigger? What if I can solve a bigger problem? Like save the oceans. I don't care which ocean I save. I don't think right now, if, you, if, if, I, if I tell you, Asfahim, with you know, being the founder of, uh, I keep forgetting the name of your startup, man, Seafood Souk. I keep wondering if it's Souk Seafood or Seafood Souk. As the co-founder of Seafood Souk, do you, does it matter to you if you save fish in the Atlantic Ocean or if in the, you save it in the Pacific Ocean? Or does it matter? To, like, I don't think you, I think you're, you're agnostic to how the fish yeah, you look, it's a global problem. It's a global problem. But I mean, you don't have, you don't distinguish between the read, between the different seafood, you know? No, no, no. Look, I, I him, let me put it this way. When we started the business, 100% of our trade was fish coming into the UAE. Mm. So we started the business. Last month, 80% of our trade was international. What I mean by that, it was from Asia into the US or Europe yeah. or Africa into Asia. We never saw the fish. It never arrived here for consumption. Wow. Right? It is a global platform. 80% of our trade is, doesn't have nothing to do with the UAE. Region agnostic. It just has nothing to do with the UAE where we're yeah. based. 20% of what we trade comes into the UAE. Yeah. That, put that into perspective. Like, that's how you know you're solving a global problem. I'm trying to, so do you, listen, you, you look like somebody who has it together. You are full with positive energy. I'm not trying to just like shower you with compliments here, but it sounds to me like everybody that is really focused on the problem they're solving above everything else is comfortable and is living a life that does not have an existential problem because they, they don't have to worry about what am I doing in my life. They found a problem big enough. And I just, I find that this is, if, if there's one thing that I hope that from this podcast we could inspire people, by the way, including myself as somebody who I was telling earlier, grapples with his own startup, not being impactful enough, at least to my, uh, in, in comparison to my aspirations. The importance of really finding a problem that you care about first and foremost, and then worrying about the market and the commercial opportunity. Look, let me, let me give you the, the question I asked you at the start of this, you know, maybe it was off camera, but you know, I asked I ask people, when did you work out your why? Yeah. Right? Like, what was it? And people ask me, and I tell them, it was the day I saved a turtle. 
And it inspired you like that bulb. Yeah, look, we it sort of started the business. I knew I was always in the oceans and whatever. But the one day I decided to dedicate my life to this, the day I became turtle sheikh, was the day that I pulled out a drowning turtle and I saw firsthand how humans were destroying these beautiful creatures that I've loved all my life. So sometimes it takes a stimulus of that sort. Wear my little turtle bracelet. I love my little ah, turtle. Ah, that's so cool. Like, so like you I, were like, so you had to stumble into a situation that 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 just sort of like pe- pe- stuck with you. No, I mean, like people 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 tell me all the time, like you know, did you find that? I say turtles found me, right? Yeah. And dedicating my life now to turtle tracking, I'll send you so you can put up some images of turtle tracks and where they go yeah. and when we track them and how we track them around the world. So we didn't talk about that. We actually um, we fund turtle tracking. So yeah. you can actually see where they travel, right? Um, and and I realized just there and then in that moment when I was sort of pulling this turtle out of the ocean, holding this animal that was dying, and I'd saved it from drowning. And that's and it. Was like, and like from that moment on, I was like, this is it. Like, You're right. And then the day we released Farah, I'll actually send you Farah's track so you can show. Farah the turtle. Farah, Farah the was, turtle. Yeah. You know Earlier we were talking about how important it is to have attachment to your impact and the problem that you're solving, and the way you describe it is actually very admirable. And I'm sure it's you're 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 genuine about it. It's just like you you know at the core of what you're trying to do is um, save marine life and and improve this entire supply chain to make it more um, to to improve ethical sourcing and all that stuff. But like, to what extent do you think it would help your business if your tagline is? Eat fresh oysters. Like know where your oysters are coming from. Like like more consume. Like the moment you tell consumers this is about saving the, you know, saving the fish, you know, it's nice. Like people might get, oh, that's so nice. You know, I care about the seafood. But like maybe uh, to what extent is your value proposition pitched as you know 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 which fish you're eating? Well, that's that's what it is. So my personal mission is saving the oceans. But on the on yeah exactly. So it's it's always two hats you have to wear, right? Like the the, the company is very different. I'm not the best spokesperson for the company. You know, Sean's a much better spokesperson for the company. Yeah. You know, for us, when when we 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 talk about discover the journey of your of your of your seafood, like we need to understand what what you're eating and where it comes from. Yeah. Um, for us, what was what was more fascinating was that you know these problems were created by business, and we needed to solve it for business. The end consumer is great, but being a B two C platform, we would have run out of cash ages ago. Like it's just it's too difficult. So you know, discover the discover the journey, as we call it. You know, which I think the hashtag on my on my shirt yeah. for SFS Trace. You know, it, it goes above and beyond seafood. You know, I'll tell you something super interesting. I found out saffron is massive fraud in saffron. Take the hair on the end of the air of corn. Yeah chop it up it has zero negative effect when you consume it you mix it with real saffron you like for extra production honey oh, so much so much fraud in honey very similar to cocaine yeah i guess you know the drug is you're cutting your you're cutting your saffron with <laughs> corn um you know <laughs> who would have thought so so uh, so the the uh, the idea that you know provenance of food is becoming more an issue you know massive wow. global Food producers are talking about traceability being more important. We, we started this four yeah. years ago. It's going to take time to change consumer behaviors. What is fascinating is that we're seeing business behavior changing. You know, I had a guy called Matt Toogood, who is the co- uh, founder of Ro- co-founder of Raw Coffee. I don't know if you've had Raw Coffee. Yeah, I know Matt. Oh, you know Matt? Yeah, of course. Lovely guy. Great guy. One of the coolest. I met him for the first time when he showed up on the podcast. We had one of the best podcast sessions. And he spoke to me about how uh, much child labor, exploitation, and unethical sourcing of coffee goes on around the world uh, to get that kind of premium coffee and how focused they are on ethical sourcing of coffee and, and i'm a regular i mean i'm I, I'm at raw coffee once a week uh, you know i have my grinder here i did the barista and i did not re- i was so ignorant about what's going on you know in the valley chain of food when i'm eating what i'm eating i don't examine and it turns out there's like all these blockchain solutions now so, yeah. That are allowing you to trace exactly if this uh, kind of product that you're eating is coming from an ethically sourced uh, yeah, producer. Think, look, or compli- look, the one thing I will tell you, supply chains are super complex. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and lifting the lid on supply chains is something that's so difficult to do. Uh, we know we're in it, right, with one, with one food product, which is a very complex food product. There's multiple, you know, seafood is, sounds basic like coffee, um, but there's, you know, thousands of different types of fish and treatments of fish. Um, I guess the question is, we come from extremely privileged backgrounds, right? Like, you're, you're, here's two very well-educated guys sitting here drinking tea, talking about complex supply chains. Yeah. Um, do you think the fishermen in in Africa, on the on the on the east coast of Africa, really care about that? Uh, they're they just trying to make ends meet. Correct. Yeah. So, which is why I say it's a business problem. Mm. <coughs> you know, I can get all the best restaurants in the world serving only traceable fish, and so all the best restaurants in Dubai here 
yeah. source traceable fish through us or our partners, right? The distributors that are that are using our trace technology. Soon enough, one of the largest supermarket retailers, their entire fish counter will have SFS trace where you can prove where your fish has come from. That's great. The question is, it's the supply chain issue. So who are the distributors in the middle? Who are the guys producing this product? That's where you're actually solving it for. Right. You're not solving it for me telling you, hey, you should ask more questions about what salmon you're eating. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that makes a lot of right. sense. Consumer behavior will drive that change slowly, but it's actually business behavior that drives it quicker. SFS Trace, one of the biggest use cases for SFS Trace is large hotel groups asking us to build them dashboards so that they can report to their shareholders how sustainable their sourcing is. Like that is that yeah. is how you solve problems. Just just for anybody, the SFS Trace stands for seafood, uh, sorry, sea, uh, seafood soup. Seafood soup trace, basically. But it can be applied to many different food products. But at the moment, it is a supply chain visibility yeah. and uh, traceability tool to understand what seafood you're eating and where it's come from. And if you're at a restaurant in Dubai, like I say, ask ask the waiter, so where does that piece of salmon come from? So without... That black cod. Yeah. They w like It's not a question that you could uh, get an answer for. No, I just don't think many people ask. Like if you look yeah. at a menu, the way we even advertise... Yeah. I go to the main regularly... Um, you Great know guys, yeah, of course. They they, they serve Diba Bay. They serve great oysters. The, the, co the best oysters in town, I co think. Co-founders co are friends. That's actually a great global story. It's just a restaurant. I mean, not just a restaurant. Sorry, I don't want to belittle it. I mean, it's it is a restaurant that started in the UAE and is now expanding globally. That's another good example of like yeah, uh, look what David what David and Joey did, and looks Joey's brainchild, and David got behind it. Like we're hey, there once a week, by the way. Yeah, look, the main is a, is a fascinating is a fascinating project. I think it. it it highlighted what Dubai could stand for. But Joey is an extremely talented creative. Yeah. And I don't think he gets, you know, he gets this, he's a restaurateur and he's a this and he's that. He's an extremely hardworking creative guy. Yeah. And and a lot of the projects that he does have this Joey touch to it that I think is, is fascinating. And I you know, that Joey and I actually met through seafood. I was going to ask, like, how do you know him so well? Uh, through the oyster farm. Okay. We well, because they're very them. known for their oysters. Their oysters are out of this world. Yeah, like, no, that Joey and I were talking. Joey, Fendi Clear. Yeah, and no, no, they, they serve Diba Bay oysters. Just ask Joey, you know, about the, about Diba Bay. You know, that's we met for the first time at Diba Bay oysters. Yeah, in Fajera, him and I were on, were on a boat and we were talking about provenance of, of food. I, you know, I think I think I think the UAE specifically will now start exporting more innovation creativity than it has before yeah and with that comes a sense of um pride but also and i've said this openly so i'll say it again on your on your podcast um i said this at the entrepreneurship festival where i openly admitted to the world that was watching my youtube video and in the audience is that the one thing the arab world still suffers from is uh, an inferiority complex. Yeah, I was going to actually, as you were saying this, I'm pulling up this is one of my favorite quotes. I don't usually do quotes on my podcast, but this one does um, stick with me because um, I think this is a little bit of what the ecosystem for startups or entrepreneurship in Dubai might be missing, but it's also on the cusp of, you know, doubling down on compared to, let's say, New York and Silicon Valley. Um, let me see. So it's a Marianne Williamson quote. Pulling up quotes, man. Look how fancy. Yeah, I is. never thought I'd do this, but like not, this, I don't. This might be the first episode I do this with. The quote goes as follows, and I remember this from Coach Carter. You remember that movie, Coach Carter? Yeah, I've seen it once. Samuel L. Jackson. I don't play as much basketball as you, but <laughs> I'm five foot six. I'm not very tall. Like this podcast makes me look tall. I'm really not that tall. So this this quote is famous for being spoken uh, like uh, recited at graduation ceremonies and stuff. But I, I I always thought it's a great quote. The first time I ever heard it was on Coach Carter the movie. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of god that is within us it is not just in some of us it is in everyone and as we let our own light shine we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same as we are liberated from our own fear our presence automatically liberates others and the reason i find this quote to be so like powerful is because i think stories like this what you guys are doing and other great ambitions to think beyond the region and the globe 
is what keeps people sets the bar and creates this appetite the, the, the ambition to 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 grow even further and, and 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 we all set examples for each other and we all pull each other up yeah look i think you know please you know anybody that's watching this if you want to see me speak um you know in a much shorter sort of context this, this, this speech that i gave after muhammad abbar and before gary v at uh at the Sharjah entrepreneurship festival where i talked about this inferiority complex and the inferiority complex sort of idea came around when I started to get a lot of commentary um, as I left consulting. And it was very much, you know, they used to, everybody used to say to me, Faham, you're really smart for an Emirati. <laughs> and it was just like, ba- <laughs> it was just like backhanded compliment. Yeah. Like, are you like, what are you like, compare me to like a hundred thousand people? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a million of us. Like you're comparing me to a million people. Like, I don't like my ambitions aren't to be, you know, like impactful for an Emirati. You know, and I always say this, I think, you think Muhammad Rashid, Sheikh Muhammad Rashid built Dubai like a great for an Emirati. You think His Highness, the ruler of Sharjah, you know, built universities um, in Sharjah thinking this would be good for an Emirati. Do you think Muhammad Al-Abbar, when he was building Burj Khalifa, stopped yeah. and went, let's build a tall building for an Emirati? Like, we have to complete on the globe. And I don't know yeah. why we still suffer sometimes as the Arab world, not just the UAE, for this inferiority complex. Like, yeah. West is best is like, you know, that was like 1980s, man. Like, but but so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and to the extent that there's a socioeconomic pyramid, of course there is in the world, your standard and your ambitions are not defined by being an Emirati, and that as it should be, because you're clearly somebody went to Oxford, went to Kearney. Cambridge, we have to Sorry, Cambridge, Cambridge <laughs> my bad, sorry. Um, yeah, but, but like clearly privileged, lucky, and obviously very uh, much a hustler and smart, but then you are to the Emiratis. A high enough example to 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 you know live and die to become like that, and maybe even if you get there because you manage to become even more than that, as you are today aiming to become more than that. And I think we're all looking for a, a bar within our vision to aim for, and we all should have one. Look, let me, let me and we all inspire each other in different ways. Let me think about. Let me let me give, leave you with a thought, right? And this maybe is the way that I close most discussions. Sure, is that. We're still young. Most successful entrepreneurs statistically do things 10 years from where we are today. Yeah. Which means if you actually put yourself on the journey, you're not even at halfway. Right? Think about that for a second. We've been working for 15, 16 years. Right? We're not even halfway. Probably a third of the way through. We're at the peak of our experience and our... Longevity. Well, no. So at the age of 40, a dear friend of mine and somebody I regard as a mentor, though he hates me saying it, uh, 40 is when people stop asking you what you want to do and ask you what you've done. It's a very, very unique turning point. But before you get there, you're still in learning phase and trial phase and you can fail and still bounce back. Right. I know guys that are failing at 40, failing at 50, right? And they're still picking themselves up. So the point is, is that, you know, we're a third of the way through. Let's admit that we're a third of the way through. Of our lifetime, yeah. Not of our lifetime, of our just of our working experience, right? Sure. Like this is yeah. this is just this is just the work part. Yeah. Our career. Which means they have a lot of time. Which means stop rushing. Yeah. You know, if seafood soup takes us another ten years to get to where we want it to be, let it take ten years to, you know, help people discover the journey of their fish and solve, you know, for, for a very opaque supply chain. I have all the time in the world. Yeah. Right. The other thing and this is where I'll leave you, is that saving a turtle definitely changed my life. But the biggest turning point in my life was becoming a dad, right? I was blessed with twins, super mom, you know, my wife. And they got to the age where we had to pick a school. And I was raised by a single mom, so I called my mom. I said, Mom, how did you pick a school for us? And she says, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, I moved to live with my mom when I was 10 years old. And she had to pick a school for us. And I graduated from that school and I went off to Lancaster University and then later on to Cambridge and got my job and started working. And, and alhamdulillah, I've been very, very successful in, in, in what I consider. I never thought I'd be here. Like if everything ended tomorrow, like I've already achieved more than I ever thought I was going sure, to. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I told my mom, I was like, so how did you know that was the right school? And she went, what are you talking about? I just found a school that would take four kids midterm. And I put you four, I have three brothers, like you four in that school. 
like, what are you thinking about? And I said to my mom, I said, mom, like, I have two kids and I've done the calculations and they're gonna basically be looking for a job in about 2035, 2036, right? Sure. If they go to university, if university is a concept still exists. If robots haven't replaced us by right. then, yeah. So, but they're going to be s looking for a job in 2036. And I can tell you, I don't know what 2026 will look like. So how do I choose an education system that will prepare my kids for 2036? Ken Robinson was the first one to introduce this concept. Is that you, you're putting your kids in a school, preparing them for 14 years later, 15 years later, right? 12 years, K-12, plus then university, three to four years. Yeah. And my mom was just like, you're overthinking this fine. And I stopped and I, I had this very, very sort of introspective moment where I was like, am I thinking about this too much? Is this the right way to be thinking about this? And maybe a reductive argument, mm -hmm. but I basically simmered it down to four things. In 2036, we're still gonna have four global challenges. Mm -hmm. Water, our environment, energy and social inequality or economic gaps mm. within society across countries and whatever are the first three mutually exclusive uh, like uh, we go all carny on me no no but i'm just saying yes and no yes and but no. I, I think i hear you so there's a lack of clear uh, let me put it this way yeah. fishing is part of solving the environment it has nothing to do with energy right like fair enough right. I hear like you. you see what i mean like we have to we have to we have to maslow's hierarchy we need to give people access to clean water we need to power economies. Okay. Yeah. We need to make sure we're not doing that at the detriment of the wider environment that is not water. Yes, you can club water. And there is shortage the of clean water. But there is water is a very, very unique, large enough to be there in the list by itself. Oh. But also social inequality that we aren't continuing That's to sure. wide, widen the economic gap. Yeah. So how I think about life today. And maybe, the, you know, I think of, I think too much these days, but maybe the secret to how to make sure that what you're investing in, the problems you are trying to solve, and if you are a parent preparing your children for a future, is to think about the world 20 years from now and say what problems will they still exist. Because if I'm preparing wow. my kids to solve those problems, then it doesn't matter what they studied, what school they went to, and how they did. Is they, if they are being born to understand how to solve those problems... They will be relevant. They'll be relevant. They'll at least have a purpose in life, right? Which I think is also very... It's a great way to think. Bro, you got to be a parent to think like that. I mean, I don't think like that because I don't have kids. But I guess you need to have kids to think about what are the problems that will continue to exist and how can I set up... How can I raise my kids so that by the time that they're ready to solve problems these problems are probably going to still be around. They're not going to go anywhere. I, I, I don't None think of so. the problems you mentioned are going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. But like, if you, I think... That's a great way to go about but it. But I think if you think as an entrepreneur, if you are an entrepreneur yourself, you, you're thinking about... If, if, if you believe that entrepreneurship is in the business of solving problems, and maybe if you're smart enough solving one problem... That's one great way to go about it. Then the great way to approach parenting is the same way. It's to say, let me prepare my kids to solve problems. Fascinating. Thank you. Thanks no. for the time. Thank you for coming, bro. Uh, listen, uh, this has Just been... Just leave your mic drop with that nugget. <laughs> it, it, it's, it was mic drop worthy, but uh, unfortunately the mic is tied to a bunch of wires. No worries. I'll take it out of you. Thanks Habibi, so much for having me. Uh, it's been a real honor. Uh, you've been a great friend from the first time I met you. Shout out to Elias Qawar, by the way, because I think he had... Reconnected us. Well, he initially connected us because he was a reason why I joined Kearney. And then when I first joined Kearney day one, he's like, come meet this guy. <laughs> He's a sheikh, uh, but he's like the mo coolest Emirati you're gonna meet, and you you actually really are probably top three Re coolest Emiratis I know. Really I cool for an Emirati. No, no, you've pr <laughs> for a, you're pretty cool. Period. But like, definitely, uh, t you know, I have I've actually have the privilege to meet a bunch of really cool Emiratis uh, over the last fifteen years. But uh, it's been a real honor to connect with you again and to have you here. Thank you. I hope it's not gonna be the last time I have you on the show. Inshallah, invite me back. Uh, yeah, no, you, you, uh, the invitation is open, but um, this has been a privilege. Now, listen, for anybody listening and watching uh, that is fascinated about marine life and learning more about uh, seafood souk and what you guys are doing, I'm going to include a bunch of links about uh, the whole turtle sheikh thing and what you guys have done saving Thank turtles. You. We're going to include um, links also for seafood souk, but for anybody that would like to follow you on LinkedIn, 
فاهم القاسمي ذات اف اي اتش اي ام سبيس اي ال سبيس كيو اي اس اي ام اي كيو اي اس اي ام اي كيو اي اس اي ام اي قاسمي اون لينكدين سي فود سوق دوت كوم كوريكت Um, and uh, a bunch of links will be included on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. Thank you again for coming. Thanks It's been so great seeing you again, buddy. Thanks and for being so generous with your time. That's a wrap. Bye.